So macro picture overall is not great. To make things even more interesting, you know, you have a rise of nationalism. So that's a kind of a very tepid macro picture. Yeah. And then you look at the valuation of the US market and we basically, it rivals today valuation of 1999 or 1929. So the stocks are expensive. Mm -hmm. So this is the terrain we right. have in front of us, right? Yep. So how does one construct a portfolio for that? You basically want to own companies as if things hit the fan, basically. I'm Tony Greer, editor of the Morning Navigator newsletter. I'm excited for my conversation today with my friend Vitali Katzenelson. He's a die-hard value investor. He's a published author and CEO of Denver-based investment firm IMA. Vitali, how are you today? It's my pleasure. Great, thank you. Good, man. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. I was first drawn to your work um, of your market analysis by the metaphors that you use to music and art. I started reading your newsletter and I love that you open up every day, usually with something sort of, you know, mind expanding and not drilling right down into the markets. How do you come up with the metaphors? How does the art relate to the market so easily for you? Well, I spend a lot of time in the morning sitting in a dark room, staring at the computer. And it's almost like meditation in itself. Yeah. I, you know, as you, you always try, when you write, you always try, you know, you try to find a way to explain something that is complex in an easy way, and metaphors are usually a way to do this. And then I, I love art, I love classical music, and so I'm just, life is too short if I just write about, just, just write about investing. Yeah, so. that's so true, I couldn't agree more, I couldn't agree more. Sometimes when you see something in the markets, it becomes naturally in your head, and you're like, oh, that's just like a song, or it reminds me of a painting. So you know what happens, actually, it's kind of interesting. So if you, if you write, and I, I write every day for an hour, an hour, an hour and a half a day, if you write, you, you start thinking like a writer. And what I mean by this, you start looking for metaphors. Actually, this is a perfect analogy. So I, you know, I live in Denver and 100 miles away from a, a lot of ski resorts. Mm -hmm. And I skied for a long time and I thought I was a good skier. And I thought it was a good skier because we skied in, we skied in, Key, in Keystone with the mountains. It's a relatively small resort and the, and the mountain is perfectly groomed. Mm. I was always the first one down the mountain and I felt like I'm a very good skier. And then one day we went to Vail and it's, it snowed a lot. The snow was very deep and it was horrible. And I would, I would fall like every five minutes and I hurt my shoulder actually. So how does it relate to the market? So here is mm. an analogy. If you were investing in the market over the last 10 years, then basically Federal Reserve basically groomed the slopes. You are like your skin in Keystone. Keystone. So you think you have a great, perfect form, etc. Except this is not the real market. At some point, we're going to have a real market and it's going to snow a lot. And you're going to find out that you are probably not as good of an investor as you thought you were. Just be, 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 because the slopes would not be perfectly groomed. That's right. So that's like... Great. That, 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 is a, that is an analogy. Perfect right analogy, right? You open somebody's eyes with just such a simple, simple story, and it relates right directly to the markets. Yes. So now let me ask you another question, mm -hmm. Vitali. How were you um, so inspired by the financial markets? When did they finally become something in your life that you decided, okay, this is something that uh, I want to do and pursue? So I grew up in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, in Soviet Russia, not just Russia, Soviet Russia. So they, I knew very little about financial markets. Uh, when I thought about investing, my images would be very close to the traded places when they were trading, I don't know, uh, orange futures or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know. So I always thought investing is basically a lot, you know, a lot of people yelling at New York Stock Exchange. That's what I thought investing was. Yeah. So uh, when I came to the United States, I was very good with computers. I knew nothing about investing. And I was going through majors in college, like uh, Dean Martin was going through girlfriends. How's that? Yeah, yeah good, perfect. <laughs> I, I, the analogy's coming, I get this. Uh, but anyway, and, I, and then I got a job with an investment firm. Uh, they hired me because I was good with computers. And they had a Bloomberg terminal, and I t started talking to other portfolio managers. And I realized, my God, this is, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So at that point, my life became much simpler because I realized I changed my major for the last time to finance. And that was it. That's amazing. I find it amazing that you t pivoted toward finance and decided that your life became much simpler. Well, be well, because at this point I knew, you know, once you have a focus, yeah. right, then it's you can yes. become more single-minded yeah. about your career. Exactly. Totally, yes. totally, yes. very yeah. cool. So, along the lines of the awesome metaphors that you construct, I was listening to a podcast that you did that mm -hmm. I really enjoyed, where you went over um, your sort of all-terrain portfolio. 
Tell me a little bit about that because I think that our audience would appreciate yeah. it. So to talk about alternate portfolio, we kind of got to talk about the macro picture a little sure. bit. So if you look at the economy, not just US economy, US economy, but global economy, you'll find you, you, you'll realize that if you look at the US, uh, our market, our debt has doubled over the last 10 years and interest rates are lower probably now than they were 10 years ago, or mm -hmm. close to that. Okay. Uh, so the, if you look at the Europe, the picture is very similar, except you have a union of, uh, you have kind of a dysfunctional marriage mm -hmm. you know, of a lot of countries. Yep. So it's not just, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a very big dysfunctional marriage. Yep. And then you look at China and you, and you see that, you know, this is a, an enormous bubble, which uh, you kind of, it's been going on for so long, it's like you don't want to talk about it anymore because yeah. it's, 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 you know, but it's an enormous bubble. You have a huge overcapacity. The debt, the debt probably quadrupled over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then you look at Japan, and Japan is basically the most indebted nation in the world, in, in a uh, first world country at least. The population is shrinking, and if you look, so, de so debt per capita actually has, is growing at a faster rate than debt, debt per GDP. So macro picture overall is not very, it's not great. To make things even more interesting, you know, you, you have a rise of nationalism, which we're always seeing today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a kind of a very tepid macro picture. Yeah. And then you look at the valuation of the US market, and we basically, you know, it rivals today valuation of 1999 or 1929. So the stocks are expensive. Mm -hmm. So this is the terrain we right. have in front of us, right? Yep. So how does one construct a portfolio for that? You basically want to own companies as if things hit the fan, basically. So if, let's, let's go back to the analogies, yeah. right? So if you own the, like a Range Rover or Jeep, you know, uh, mm. of if you know, over the last ten years, probably did not benefit you because you, you know, you were bid by very fast cars like Ferraris, etc. Okay, Ferrari is great when you have this, you know, uh, perfectly paved road. Yep. The problem is that's not the road most likely going to be ahead of us. So therefore, you want to own stocks that can get through this. So, like what are those stocks? Yeah. Companies that have significant competitive advantage, that uh, basically high quality companies, significant competitive advantage, high recurrence of revenue, very little debt, whose business is very, uh, it's not cyclical or not tied to uh, health of the economy overall. So we're going bottom up, right? Looking for the companies yes. So yes. from bottom yes. up rather than top down, trying to decide what sectors we should play. So the, it's kind of interesting. So the, you're absolutely right. But very in, 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 investing is not, you know, so when, when somebody asks me, are you a top down investor or a bottom up investor, uh, I, I would quote, I think uh, somebody, somebody who said, and I'm, I'm going blank on the name, who said, we worry bottom, uh, top down and we invest bottom up. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so all the things they describe about the global economy, you have to be aware of them if you're yeah. a bottom up investor. Because when you value a company, the value of any asset is the present value of its future cash flow. Mm -hmm. So you can't really do analysis into the future cash flows and not be aware of factors that you know, may influence them. So as a, as a bottom-up investor, you can't just be ignorant about what's going on around you anymore. It's kind of interesting. Uh, in the past, be be before 2008, value investors were very proud that, you know, you know we said, we don't worry about economy. We don't yeah. worry about, you know. Agnostic, you know. yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I think there were, a lot of them got that idea from Warren Buffett, where Warren Buffett said, I don't care what Federal Reserve will do next month, except that's, they, mean, they, mean, they misunderstood Buffett. What Buffett said, he doesn't care about short term, but it doesn't mean he doesn't care about long term. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to be, um, so the way I look at the macro forecasting for value investor, you basically don't want to worry about, don't want to worry about weather. Because if you, if you try to predict the weather, which in my mind would be trying to predict what Federal Reserve will do next three months or six months, you will spend a huge amount of energy into something that has a very short term shelf life. Mm -hmm. Because you have to keep doing it every three months, yeah. okay? However, as a value investor, you want to be uh, looking at for climate change and events. Like you want to be a climatologist, right. looking for big shifts that may impact you in the long run. Yeah, I like that. So if, um, like, uh, I'll give you just one example. But if you, if you look at China, for instance, and if you ignored what's going on in China, you, would have, you, you basically would have probably overexposed to commodities. Yeah. Okay. Because China, it was the largest incremental uh, consumer of commodities, sure. right? So then you would have been annihilated in, in commodities. Right. So as, a value invest, you know, as, a, as an investor, we looked at what's going on in China, and I spent a lot of time talking about it, and then we avoided the carnage that came from commodities, mm -hmm. as, as an example. Right.
No, that's very smart. It's very smart. While you're, you know, while you're going over this, I'm trying to go over my portfolio to decide if I have enough rough terrain stocks in it. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about some of the stocks that you think will make it through? Like in my mind, I'm going through names that are like, you know, I'm trying to pick out refineries or tech companies that I think will, that are going to be, you know, not as affected by, you know, an economic slowdown or things like that. Or maybe an industrial company that sells razor blades is going to be safe through a pullback in an economic recession. What kind of company? Companies do you want to buy? We have a lot of exposure to healthcare, and if you look at healthcare, seg uh, so the famous bank robber who said, "Why do you rob bank?" You know, when, when he asked, "Why do you rob banks?" He said, "That's where the money is." Yeah. So as, <laughs> as a value investor, we gravitated towards the healthcare companies because they, that's the sector that checks off a lot of boxes. Yeah, constant cash flow. Yeah, right? it's a it's a rising demand. You have a you know you uh, you have very predictable cash flows. You have a pricing power. And uh, you have, for the most part, very good balance sheets, which yeah. is very important. And one factor we haven't discussed yet, they have very compelling valuations because as a, as a sector overall, and you know, it's probably prob one of the cheaper sectors today, and you know, outside of maybe oil stocks or something, mm -hmm. but that's probably one of the most attractive sectors overall, and that we have a lot of exposure to that. Really interesting, I like it. Is there a place for commodities in your Portfolio? When you talk about commodities, let's break them up into two Let's do that. Yeah. I can break them up into individuals if you want. We no, have time. No, but to me, it's like you have industrial commodities and you have precious metals. Fair. So two, uh, two different commodities. Let's start with precious metals. So that would be gold. Gold and silver. Uh, yeah, go, go, gold and silver. And I probably would put silver you know, somewhere in between because it's half precious, you know, half of it is used for industrial. Partially industrial, yeah, yeah, yeah. partially precious. Gold is a lot more. Uh, so if you and I talked 10 years ago, here's what I would, told, uh, I would have told you. I said gold to me is an investable. Here's why. As a value investor, it's very important for me to be rational. The way the way I can be rational, when I analyze a company, I actually I get a fairly good idea how much it's worth. Mm -hmm. When we, we, you and I can have a debate how much Microsoft worth, etc., and we're going to have a range, you know. Fair. Okay. With gold, it's very difficult to have this debate because it has no cash flows. It has a cost of carry. If you actually own physical gold and you put it in the bank, actually, you know, storage. Yeah, there's storage cost, right? So I would have told you that gold is not something that value invest. Yeah, I would own. Today, we still don't own gold, but I'm gradually warming up to it, and here's why. We live in a world today where $17 trillion of debt has negative interest rate. Like, the words negative interest rate, I don't even understand what it means. Yeah. Like, it's like something like... If it's you like take an it, oxymoron. It's, it's a, yeah, it is an oxymoron. Right? Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Because if I give you $100 and you pay me back $90, we would call it a default. Not in, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Not, no, it's not, true. Not a negative Such a great rate. point. The so, market's trying to figure out exactly what it is, in my opinion, and I don't think anybody has the answer. That's right. And what's interesting, you know, what's interesting about this is that in the past, our policy was, U.S. policy was, we want to have a stronger dollar. Today, we are literally trying to compete with other countries that have either zero interest rates or negative interest rates to drive our, our interest rates down. Mm -hmm. So you, we basically operate, we are kind of uh, going towards the... Um, command-controlled economy of Soviet yeah. Russia, yeah. where the most important commodity in the world, which is, you know, price of money, right. is set by central bankers. Right. So, and therefore, you, when you do this, you lose signal, you know, the markets are losing signal mechanism, mm -hmm. okay? Because there is a reason why market forces set, you know, price for commodities or whatever goods, yep. because if, uh, if there's too much demand for it and the price goes up, you know to produce more, okay? Right, well, the signals, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This, mm -hmm. And uh, that signal mechanism has been damaged by central bankers mm -hmm. today. So we are in the world where you have negative interest rates, so suddenly gold does not, is, does not sound as crazy anymore, okay? So we, you know, to be fair, we don't own gold yet, and we're still mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's the best way to invest in gold. Yeah. Do we want to actually you know, buy an ETF? Do we, you know, there are other alternatives. Let's talk about, that's one precious metal. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, when you talk about industrial commodities, mm -hmm. um, it becomes more difficult yeah. bec to me because for the most part, their price is set by the you know, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And if you're concerned about the health of the global economy, then you, you understand where you know, the problems with future demand may be, yeah. and especially the problems with China. So I, we, and usually these companies, and I'm generalizing right now, are not very good businesses. Usually a lot of that, yep. very cyclical, 
a low return on capital. So dangerous be, mining operations. There's all kinds of yeah. hurdles for base metals. Not to mention that sometimes they go off in different directions. Like now we've got the price of nickel rallying because of what's going on in, in Indonesia. And generally, copper and aluminum are just getting hit right now with you know fears of demand destruction. So they're a little bit difficult to keep yeah. track on. What about oil? Before we leave the commodity space, yeah. I want to know if you have a strong view there because I, I'm starting to develop. Yeah, so the oil, you know, and if we have no exposure to it today, but in the short run, I would say probably I would be bullish, and then in the long run, I'm bearish. Mm -hmm. And in, the, the only reason I'm bullish, I mean, in the short run, just because the price of oil was very low for a while, and that probably destroyed a lot of supply. And so, again, this is a generalist yep. you know, kind of... Totally fair, you know, When you've seen the cycles before, and this you know, may open up a, a big can of worms, but I, in the long run, I think electric vehicles are the future. And therefore, and, you know, you know, they, they, you know that's, a big, that's a big headwind for the oil industry. In the long run, I would tend to agree that that is going to be a, uh, a, a, a headwind, but I'm also, like you, I'm very bullish in the short run because the geopolitical situation is changing so dramatically right now that I just think the risk premium on oil is too low. Mm -hmm. But that's something that we can argue about forever because I've just been trying to express it by being long oil volatility because it's been gyrating so mm -hmm. aggressively mm -hmm. back and forth. So we don't have to pick a direction on that now. This does probably relate to another research project that you've worked very diligently on when you say electric cars are the future. So tell me what you think about, um, we should get a drum roll or something here, but yeah. I would love to hear what you think about <laughs> Tesla. Uh, okay, so I, there's a preface to the story. Um, Go ahead. I made a reservation for Model 3 in 2015, I think, when they, when they just announced it. For the thousand hours, two and a half years later, I get email that you can go buy your car. So I can't show up to the you know, showroom, they don't have a Model 3 for me to test drive, and uh, the car that I thought was gonna cost me $35,000 now, you know, two-wheel drive cost me a lot more, et cetera. So long story short, I got my thousand dollars back, and that was it. Gotcha. So three months ago, I actually bought Model 3. At this point, a few things changed. The pricing got much better. They came out with a four-wheel drive car, and uh, I was able to, you know, to test drive it. Okay. And I, after, you know, so normal person buys a car, likes it, and just enjoys driving it. So yeah. I, I, you know, I enjoyed driving it too, but then I sat down and wrote a 37 page article on it. Like, I'm calling it an article probably after 37 pages. Yeah. You can't really call it an article anymore, but it was it's a, a short story on yeah, Tesla, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah it's, like <laughs> it's like a mini book. One thing I realized electric car is the car of the future. Yeah. I didn't say Tesla, you know, yeah. which is, that's a different, you know, that's a different conclusion, but mm -hmm. electric car is the car of the future yeah. for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a much, it's a much better vehicle. It's a much faster. It's a much simpler vehicle. The normal car has about, you know, the engine has 5,000 uh, 5, parts, moving parts. It has to be cooled down. There is a lot of oil flowing. There is a lot of gears going on. Yeah. Electric car, the engine, does not need oil for the most part. Right. It's a very it's a very simple mechanism. Yeah. Uh, the it has very few moving parts. It doesn't need you know it doesn't need it doesn't have a radiator. It does not have the complex transmission. All these different things. So you it's it is a much it requires a lot less maintenance. Less resources, right? Yeah, yeah. less less resources. In addition to this, it's a you know from all this, you know, aside of all these things from a, if if you were government, you know when you have a gasoline car. You basically tie yourself to oil. Yeah. Electricity, you know, could be produced using different resources. Mm -hmm. uh, today, roughly about seventy percent of electricity is still produced produced using uh, basic yeah, oil, natural, natural, gas, uh, you know, natural gas, et cetera, Yes, uh, coal, etc. But the but you have, now you have choices. You can use nuclear. You could use solar. You can use wind. You can you you can you, you can also use hydro. So you have a lot more uh, uh, you have a lot more uh, options. So. And as a technology, electric cars are just superior than gasoline cars. There's okay. no, no question about it. You know, aside from environmental benefits, et cetera, it's a much better technology. Okay. I can but, accept that. So we can accept that. Okay. So now, as I was analyzing Tesla, I was thinking, well, is this the company that's going to succeed? And uh, as I was researching and speaking of analogies, I realized one of the good, an analogy that may be happening, you know, that may be transpiring right now, we may be in 2008. 2009, an iPhone was introduced in 2007. And we may be having this iPhone moment where the General Motors and Fords, et cetera, 
they are the Nokias of the world. They own they own the industry. They own the like Nokia was the king the of traditional dumb phones. platform. Yes, right. The, yeah. Nokia was the king of dumb phones. Yeah. General Motors is the you know, and, and the others are the the kings of uh, combustible engine. Dumb cars. Let's yeah. call this just dumb to make cars, it right, the, the right. dumb cars, where electric car is a tr- is in is a very different. Even though it looks the same, it's very different inside. Yeah, it's a it's the true. battery. You know, so where in the in a gasoline car, the engine is the most important part. Where this where these uh, companies have huge. Uh, I don't know. Spend hundreds, probably billions of hours of on R and D. Yeah. All that knowledge it becomes irrelevant when it goes to, when you go to electric car because right. the most important part of electric car is actually the battery. And so the just like Nokia has, you know, even though when uh, iPhone came out, Nokia should have looked at Apple and said, "Thank you so much, Apple. Now we know what the future phone would look like." Right. That didn't happen, and here's why: because you had a ch- you shifted from one domain to another. It's a shift in domains. It's not just like we introduced um, uh, just a little bit better smart dumb phone. Even though dumb phone smartphones still made phone calls. That was probably the least important part of the device, right? Right, and it birthed a new product line entirely, right? Yes. Like we're an entire vertical of new products. Yes, out, you right? go from one ecosystem to another. Yeah. To, to another. Yeah, I can see that. And so when you go from one domain to another, your assets become your liabilities. I'll give you an example. Mm. Just think about this for a yeah. second. So, Nokia had thousands of engineers that were very good at hardware, but it had very few engineers that were specialized in software user interface, right? right. So think about think about General Motors. They have thousands of engineers that are so good at designing these very complex engines, which are completely irrelevant in this new domain. Where suddenly this big concoction is replaced by this little thing that's a commodity. And then when we looked at what happened, that the uh, there was a there was a general motor strike, right? That's why you have a strike because basically employees saying, "Well, electric cars, you don't need these engines. You, need, you know, so the if you're going to start making these electric engines." We're going to make less money, and you need fewer people. You can automate it more. Mm-hmm. So, those employees are now went from being assets to become a liability. So, uh, their foot you now. This company is all of them are unionized. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, it's becoming even more difficult to make very drastic changes. You need to make. Yeah. So, the one of the takeaways from doing all this research, I realized that even though we today make a forgot, it's like a, we we assume that every uh, gasoline manufacturer, car manufacturer, will be able to transition to electric cars successfully. I think th- I would like to challenge the thesis. I'm not sure that's actually. I'm I'm not saying that's not necessarily going to happen. Right. But I'm saying that's not a hundred percent probability. Right. And you know, like if you look at the going back to Dumfries analogy, so you had a, a Nokia and Motorola and BlackBerry have made, have failed to make this transition, but then Samsung has done a great great job, has yeah. benefited from that. So. You're going to have winners and losers. Tesla's uh, final outcome, to some degree, will depend on how successful these car companies transitioning from gasoline to electric. And I think that's where uh, that's where the you know. So when it was the when we analyzed Tesla, you you, you know Real Vision did a great uh, uh, yeah. uh, great special Tesla versus Tesla Q. Yep. When you analyze Tesla, I can see both sides. Yeah. And and the naysayers, the naysayers in Tesla, they have a lot of very good, you know, very good points. Mm-hmm. In fact, I would argue Tesla is a path-dependent company. It's a company that's losing a tremendous amount of money. So for them to uh, its existence basically depends on financial markets, on the kindness of financial markets. Right? Yeah. If financial markets have a, the we work moment, right, and say, you know what? No more credit. No more credit. Right. Then suddenly the stock price collapses, right? And mm-hmm. te- and if you're a Tesla shareholder, you get diluted yeah. because they'll be issuing shares at fifty dollars, at thirty dollars, etc. Right. I still don't think Tesla will go bankrupt as that entity, just because it's going to be too valuable for somebody else. It doesn't mean as an equity shareholder you're not going to get right. spiked out. You know, right. you won't be you know be down seventy five percent. Yeah. But as a Tesla is an investment to me, this is how it looks. I can see the 75% decline if you know if financial markets you know if 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 financial markets basically stop lending the money yeah. before it gets to escape velocity, yep. and if it gets to escape velocity and it actually becomes profitable or starts losing money, I can see that you know, we're making 80 million cars a year today, globally. There is absolutely no reason at that point, and again, this depends on how General Motors and Ford's and everybody else responds. How they pivot, they right. can't. 
take market share and mm -hmm. make start making a couple million cars a year. And if that's the case, you start suddenly see you know they can make tens of billions of dollars of, you know, of earnings, and therefore the stock price can go up a lot. Mm -hmm. So, so I've done all this work and I kind of somewhat frustrated, you know, walked away saying, well, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And I think this in, in invest as an investor, you don't want to look at your sunk cost and then make a decision like I need to buy or short or whatever. Sometimes just, you know, you say, well, I learned a lot. Yeah. And I walked away that's, you know, obviously saying I probably don't want to buy any gasoline making car today. Right. Uh, uh, car company and say, I'm going to do nothing. Yeah. No, I like it. That's a, uh, you know, that's the sort of cross that a trader bears, you know, you, in deciding where you want to put your risk. And sometimes you have to kick all the tires and do all the research and you come at the end of it and you don't have passion to do anything. Right. In the end, you want to decide if it's your money that's worth risking. Yeah. And if you would rather have your money in your pocket or in 10 other trades, that's the way it comes down, that's you right. know. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed that analysis because it opened up my eyes to the chance that they could survive um, even with competition coming into the picture because that was my big bearish argument. But you explained really nicely how they, they very well could. Yeah, and so the, like, just one point about Nokia. So sure. the, what Nokia did, their mistake was they tried to take, instead of starting a brand new company, okay, and, say, and giving them a limit of capital saying, go disrupt us, yeah. okay, where... You have a new CEO who can hire anybody he wants. He has a blank piece of paper and say, create a new smartphone. The Nokia, what they tried to do, they tried to take the dumb phone and stretch their uh, Symbian operating system into it, which was a dumb phone operating system. And right. if you look at the initial efforts of General Motors, you know, that's what they did, right? With bolts and bolts. That, that's, what, that's what they're trying to do. And um, people who drove, so I haven't driven the new electric cars that were made by, uh, by uh, Jaguar or General Motors, right. but the uh, the feedback I, I read about was that it's you know it drives very well mm -hmm. because they you know at the core is the electric engine yeah, right. but the software still feels like it's the software that's you know in your old lag. cars yes yes really? yes interesting where Tesla's you know Tesla software is now as a Tesla owner I, I, I and I've been lucky you know they had a lot of production issues right. but I've been lucky that I had a phenomenal car. Like right. I haven't had any problems and uh, I could had unlike others, I had great customer service when the car broke, etc. Yeah. When I had little issues come up. And uh, I can see how it's a car uh, it's a car that was designed based on first principles where you know, where you basically like, uh, Warren Buffett would call it like uh, what would Martians do? Like when you know like when you don't have the baggage when you don't have a baggage from a different industry, we just literally have a blank oh, right. piece of paper blank and say, slate, right. yes, and if you look, it's just look at the uh, Tesla mm -hmm. for a second. The way the car was designed, you, you know, so if you have a gasoline car and you want to make a four-wheel drive, you basically have to take the power from the engine and extend it to rear wheels. The other right? axis, right. Yeah, so by doing it, you actually lose power. Mm -hmm. In an electric car, and if, if you were designing, if, if, you, if you were General Motors and you were designing a car, today, you probably would do the same thing with the electric engine. Well, Tesla did not have the baggage, so they said, well, actually, we don't need to do this. Yeah. We just, you know, the engine itself is not very expensive. It doesn't weigh as much. Right. So we're literally just gonna put a, an engine on each axle. That's how they turn a car into four-wheel drive. Just, just think about it. That's, that's a very different thinking. Yeah, it's an unbelievable advantage. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is tremendous. Well, I appreciate you proving that point all the way through, Vitalia. That's a really interesting story. I want to, um, I want to pivot to hear um, what you think about a few other things before we finish up. What, do you think cryptocurrency is going to have a place in the macro world's future and/or as an investable idea? Think about this. It's a really question of what is money. Yeah. Okay. Money is a story. The dollar bill you're holding, you know, does not exist in nature. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a story that when you're five years old and you went with your father to buy milk, and he gave five dollars to. That's a story that you basically learned, you know, by observing others. It and works. We, yeah, it works, right? right? And we all believe that money is just that piece of paper. Right. Is money. It and has credibility for now. Exactly. Right. Yes. <laughs> for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a universally accepted. So gold, you can argue. You know, the gold bull you know, would argue been around forever. Mm -hmm. And so a larger portion of people buy into that story. Yep. Cryptocurrencies are kind of the, the they try to compete with gold. In, in fact, I would argue that the, it's the, the kind of the new generation, the millennials embrace it because, you know, they're not into fancy, shiny, thing, shiny right. things. Right, right. 
right? And it's so much more convenient. No, the, uh, if, you, if I gave you a million dollars in gold, it was weighing like 45, 50 pounds. Right. So you, know, you would have to make sure to work out. Right. You know, before, right, yeah. Okay, with crypto, of course, I can give you a billion dollars on a, on, a, on a stick, right? right? So it kind of makes sense on, on the surface. The yeah. problem is, the, uh, from, from, a, from, from, a, from a money perspective, where, where it gets difficult is that even though people say Bitcoin is finite, but the number of Bitcoins is not. So if you want to create Bitcoin number two or number 500, you can still do this. So right. is, can, is Bitcoin going to be the one that's surviving? So when you, when you make a bet on cryptocurrencies, the first bet you have to make, which one? Right. And so let's, but let's say you solve that, and let's say that's Bitcoin, okay? okay? Then another question is, will the governments allow that to happen? And this is where it gets very tricky. Our democracy basically de depends on our politicians making promises that they won't keep. This, okay, and that means we have inflation. And that means that that is, <laughs> I guess you can argue that inflation is at the core of social stability. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you take that away from a government, then that's a very important care that the governments don't want to lose. So I think we saw in Israel and South Korea, uh, the governments outlawed Bitcoin. And there may be, might have been other reasons for that as well, but the point is, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrencies take away government's ability to print money or to make promises they won't keep. Right. And I think that's, that's a, an enormous headwind that lies against cryptocurrencies. Right, the uncorruptible factor yeah. is what the central banks want to campaign against because they want to maintain control yes. of the money supply. Yeah. And, then, and then also, since it fluctuates so much, how do you, you know, like I think, you know, with Brexit, you know, there was a Brexit in the news and you see pound going up and down, but it goes up like 30 basis points. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And the cryptocurrency goes up 30%. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, as a money perspective, how much you and I agreed on the price as of when? Right. How much seconds? can we tolerate? How much risk exactly. can we tolerate? So, the there are a lot of factors. And, and, and then the core, we have to believe in the story. Yeah. Every, so the, for the for that to become a currency, everybody has to buy into a story. If you are if you live in Zimbabwe, in some kind of uh, uh, banana republic mm -hmm. in Africa, then I get it. I, I completely get it. It's a better alternative than you know than when you know whatever than, currency. They yeah, use. whatever currency they have. Right. In the developed countries, the way I would look at it is that I would put as much money into it as you would. Spend in Las Vegas when you go gambling. That's that's. It's my exact analogy that I've used before. I oh, have. Okay. I, I call it. I have blackjack money invested in the cryptocurrency yes. market. So that's exactly what I'm. Yeah, doing. makes sense. Uh, where gold, I could see that to be a position, and this is a very important point to make. Yeah. So the like uh, uh, gold bugs, like you know, people who really believe in gold, some of them put put 40, 50 percent of portfolio into gold. Mm -hmm. I would not do this. Right. I would look at it as a position. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, like from 1% to 3%, maybe, I don't know. Like it, it's a, as, a, as, a, as a position in the portfolio, yeah. but it should not be the portfolio. Not an overweight. Right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, and 50% is not an overweight. I don't, even, I don't even know how to describe that. Right, but, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but uh, crypto should be in basis points. You know, and, right. and this and is like smaller it, allocation. Yeah, it's a it's a gambling money. It's a like as a professional investor, I would not touch it. But right. if you are watching this and you're like, well, yeah, it's solid. It's, if you're looking for excitement and you don't have money to, and you don't yeah. want to go to Vegas, you know, it's a crypto. Yeah, <laughs> it's so. true. It used to be silver. Now it's cryptocurrency, right? Yes. That's exactly yeah. right. Oh, that's great. So on a, um, a global perspective, we have had the president and his uh, protectionist policies are obviously dramatically redoing the trade calculus around yeah. the globe. Um, we're heading into an election year. Do you have any thoughts on it in election 2020 here in the U.S.? <sighs> You, you, you save the easy questions for the end, of course. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, um, so I, I, this, this, this is where I say I'm trying to look past that. Uh -huh. Okay, and, I, and, I, and maybe I'm kind of, and I, the, 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 problem, the problem is this question is that basically, I, you know, first of all, I need to, you know, it's forced me to predict who is going to win, which I have no idea, right? right? And, and, uh, but the way I look at it, maybe it's very naive. I'm basically, no matter who is going to be in power and and if they're a lucky person or not, the United States has a very good track record to survive no matter who runs the country. And maybe this is, again, maybe I, this is idealistic, uh, maybe because I've seen so much worse and uh, grew up in Soviet Russia, and so yeah. maybe there's an optimism in me. But I feel like we, we, can, you know, we can survive no matter who, uh, who's in power. Yeah. 
And at the end, so I still would bet, if I had to make a bet like, on a country, it would still be the bet in the United States. Yeah, that's in, a great you know, point. In, 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 in general. So I try to, uh, I try to think how would it, you know, if you have a very, you know, somebody on a very right and very left common power, how would it impact the portfolio and try to make little tweaks. Yeah. But overall, I, you know, my long-term bet with you know, no matter who is in power, you ha you, you know, you, you, you're still going to have this healthy conflict Yeah. that, you know, you're going to have some kind of gridlock. So even like if you think about it from Obamacare perspective to healthcare stocks, it still was not the as draconian as people feared. And actually at the end, if you look at what happened to uh, health insurance stocks, they quadruple sense. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, you know, so there was, there was so, so I'm basically betting long term that you know we as a country will, no matter who's in power, will, will plow through that. I love it, and that is a sort of uh, I, I agree with that 100 percent that we are still going to be the best and most attractive investment center for your dollar and the safest place to put your dollar. Um, and it also dovetails with my theory that um, well, I'd like to hear yours first. What do you think about the dollar? Do you participate in this um, this intense boxing match over whether the dollar is going to retain its reserve currency, or do you do like I do and sort of just abstain and just say, look at the charts and say the dollar looks pretty stable to me and I can't get bearish because so, of the reasons that you just described yeah. that we should be still the best investment center on the planet. So well, tie that up in a bow for us. All right. So actually, so think about reserve currency. Let's say. We can argue today that Swiss Swiss may have a, let's say it's Switzerland has a better economy than we do, more stable, etc. Okay, but it's a very small country, mm -hmm. so it can be a reserve currency because for reserve currency, you basically, need several things. It has to be a very large economy. You have to, it has to be stable. Mm -hmm. You have to have a stable political system. Yeah. Okay. If those so the so once you you know kind of impose this criteria, we realize. You have very few countries left, yeah. so so <laughs> yeah, exactly. Russia is not going to be one, no. and and maybe uh, I don't know. It may the be ECB is not going to be one, ex right? Ex exactly. So we kind of we are we are the best house in a bad neighborhood. Yeah, you know, and it's, and it's not necessarily a good house. It's just better than others, yeah, right? Agreed. And that's what the so that's what the reserve currency like. And that's why the dollar is what you know is still most likely going to be the reserve currency, yeah. because. At the end of the day, we are still the most stable democracy out mm -hmm. there, and we are the largest economy, etc. So, from that perspective, my my bet would be on a, you know, long term. I don't know what that was going to be next year, etc. Right. But in the long run, I still think you know, we are it. And if you know, if you think about China, would could China, you know, China, could possibly be the reserve currency? The problem is it would cripple the economy. There is a great benefits of having reserve currency, but those are downsides too, yeah. because it drives your currency up. And if you're trying to become an exporter, then that actually that becomes a headwind to the economy. Yep. So China, and also, would you can you really have a reserve currency in a country where you don't have a free flow of capital? No. You probably can't, Absolutely. and where the price of currency is fixed. There is that argument. As well, for sure. I'm, I'm I'm sticking with the dollar strength argument. I don't think that uh, I, you know. I mean, China might be able to price some commodities in yuan and yeah. rin, rin maybe, um, but I don't think that it's going to to derail the dollar at any point. Especially like you said, you know, China debt is exploding, and China defaults are also exploding right, right alongside yeah. it. So it yeah. doesn't look like a really tempting currency to dive into at the moment. To wrap it up, Vitaly, that was uh, an outstanding full scrub of all of the topics I wanted to cover. It, I really enjoyed all of your um, your your sort of accountable arguments because they rhyme very much with mine. And even though we hadn't met before, um, we came across a lot of common ground. Mm. And I really look forward to doing some more work with you in the future. That was a great interview. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's Thank you very much, Vitaly. Thank you, Tony. Outstanding. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Vitaly as much as I did. You can hear from him on a more regular basis if you go to his website, www.contrarianedge.com. You can subscribe to his newsletter, learn more about him, and hear more about his products. I highly recommend it. For Real Vision and for TG Macro, this is Tony Greer. Thank you very much. Welcome to the end of the video. We know that on average, 85% of you who start a video on Real Vision finish it. That's extraordinary. On Facebook, it would just be 4%. And that's because Real Vision creates the most engaging content in the entire media world. Let us help you grow your business by making video content that really engages your customers. Email us at customvideo at realvision.com.